Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to a conversation with artist, Dr. Eileen Hernandez. I'm Randall Webster, one of the co-executive directors at the Art and History Museums of Maitland. This is the first talk in our series that accompanies our current exhibition at the ANH titled Love and Compassion, Images of Mother and Child. Before we start, let me just give you a little background on how, how this exhibition came to be. And Danielle, we can switch to the next slide. Great. <clears throat> the time-honored mother and child uh, exhibition theme is something that the museum had been considering for a few years. The exhibition includes three invited artists, but we also created an open call for artists. So in uh, total, we had 19 artists submit their work to the open call for the exhibition and we ended up accepting the work of eight artists. Uh, I had originally written the exhibition concept description for the call for artists several months ahead of time. Um, and then for different reasons, the exhibition got postponed. And then finally it was postponed um, until now. So as we got closer to the date to issue the call for artists, um, COVID-19 hit. Then the social unrest following the the killing of George Floyd last summer. So I decided to add a line in the exhibition description that referenced these issues in the hope that we would get some submissions that were particularly relevant to what we had been experiencing. Fortunately for us, Eileen Hernandez uh, read the description and saw how her work could be relevant to this theme. I was thrilled when I realized that her work included reference to masks and PPE and the ongoing uh, immigration struggles at the border. So I invited Eileen to participate in the exhibition and happily she accepted. So the day came when it was time for Eileen to uh, drop off her paintings and she came in and we met and, and um, we had some wonderful conversation. And, uh, she started talking about how her art was really a, a therapy for her and it uh, was so important. And as we continued to talk about it, we all started to get a little, something was, something was not quite right. We, we seemed to be missing something. There was seemed to be a part of the story that we didn't like get yet. And that's when I, the artist, Eileen Hernandez, revealed to us that she was also Dr. Hernandez. And once we knew that, um, and that she had been working as a doctor through the pandemic and had these personal stories that she could share with us from this perspective of an artist and expressing herself and working through the difficulties of last year through her art, um, we just knew that we had to um, invite her to uh, an artist talk. So thank you all for joining us tonight as we discover more about Dr. Eileen Hernandez and her art before and during the time of the pandemic. So Randall, being Dr. Sorry. Hernandez. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, would you like to say anything before we get started about um, your journey to the exhibition? I actually, I'd like to say some things. Um, first off, thank you so much, Randall, and please call me Eileen. Okay. Um, and um, I think for me, that day that the day that I went in to turn in my exhibits, I've always separated the two, and I've always it, like if it was two different identities, being the physician right. and being an artist. And then that day when I turned in the the paintings for the exhibit and all of you are asking me questions like you just mentioned, I just started realizing that I'm both. And so, yes, I need to embrace that I'm, I'm both. And, right. and I appreciate this opportunity today to be able to, to talk to others about, about this journey. Great. What motivated you to submit your art to the exhibition once you read the offer artists? So, I, throughout, throughout last year, um, 
when I I'll, I'll start to talk about like in in a little bit about my whole like journey on achieving to be an artist. But last year we we had this um we call ourselves we call ourselves the art zoom. They're like my art zoom mates. It's a phrase coined by one of my friends. Um, love her very much. Um, she in class will call us her art mates. And so last year when there was lockdown and things were closed and you can actually physically get to, you know, get to, to, to take your classes, we decided to start meeting on Zoom. And so there's four of us that actually were dedicated to continuing to meet through out the year once a week and it was a dedicated time for me. But when December came around, uh, one of the one of my art Zoom mates said, "Hey, Lynn, I found this call to artists. This is so you." And I said, "Oh, I, I, you know, I don't know. Let, let me look." And I read the description, and I said to myself, "Oh my goodness, how could I not? This is like asking me. You need to, you know, Eileen. Hey, this is talking about your all your passions, art." your practice as an obstetrics and gynecology physician, women, women's health, how could you not turn in some paintings? You know, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. So I said, okay. So I, I read a description, I get on, on the application for, you know, on the, on the website, I fill out the application, I submit things in and I said, okay, cross my fingers, I'm taking a risk. It's a museum, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna work out for me. Yeah. And. And, you know, now look at us here, you know, fast forward present day and I'm here giving, a, <laughs> I'm here giving the artist talk about, about my passion. So this Wonderful. is pretty interesting. Great. Well, uh, so hello to any of the art Zoom friends that are on the call tonight. <laughs> I don't know if any of them joined us, but I hope they're here. Uh, you're here. <laughs> so uh, you already mentioned um, kind of where your art journey began. Um, so I know you've been doing art most of your life since you were a small child. Can, do you have a story that you can tell us about one of your first memories of creating art? Um, actually, I can. And can I elaborate a little bit more about my backstory so everybody sure. can, can just come to... Come Absolutely. To, which is everything will come together. Um, yeah. I just want everybody to know that, you know, I mentioned OB, but I'm a board certified OBGYN in um, practicing about 15 years, including residency. And I'm also a mixed media artist. And I've come to incorporate the act of like a healing practice using art as therapy. I don't know, you mentioned that before in my personal life. And when I was younger, I always had a passion for both science and, and art. And this was just always really important to me. I can see this, you know, I use both, both sides of my brain. I can see the side to, to everything. And, and I love creating. And so there's a memory I recall. And <laughs> I think my mom might be on. <laughs> she might remember this. But I was about four to five years old. And I don't know why. <laughs> In my mind, this is a great idea, right? Um, I decided, oh, hey, you know what? There's a really large white wall in between the bunk beds that my sister and I shared. And um, I said, oh, look at this. It's like a blank canvas. So I went, I took my crayons and I, and I did these circles and I made them these concentric circles and I kept continuing to just increase the diameter and increase the diameter. And then they were just, it took up the whole wall. And I was just, I stepped back and I'm like, I remember this. I remember this feeling of like, how exciting. This is, um, this is beautiful. And I'm thinking to myself, maybe now, you know, that's like one of my first abstract pieces. And I'm like, oh, this is a lion, you know? Who well, I got in so much trouble for doing that. <laughs> my mom was not okay with doing that. Not okay. <laughs> I but just I love continued. that even as a child, you called it your abstract lion, that you already knew the abstract was your art. So <laughs> if I say it's a lion, it's a lion. Hey, so that's I. Right. <laughs> That's right. So I wanted to share that I actually, um, I've always, uh, you know, I excelled academically, but art was always at the forefront for me. I, um, I was involved in a lot of performances. I used to uh, sing, theater, dance. I'm, I'm recalling all these things that you just put aside and you, you kind of like forget that part of you, you know, you push it to the side. And I, I remember in junior high school taking an art class and I, I grew up, I was born and raised in New York City and I, I was able to visit all the this wonderful museums. I'm not gonna mention them all by name, but um, I I was like, oh, 
I think I, I think I want to be an artist. And I remember someone was just telling me, uh, no, you're going to be a starving artist. Stick to science. <laughs> and then and then you just feel like, you know, that that statement resonated with me for a very long time. And I just always thought to myself, why can't I do both or be both? Why, why can't I do that? And, you know, you just don't know enough. You know, you're a kid. So I, you know, I continued throughout my undergraduate career, pursuing and doing things involving art. My actually, by my third and fourth year, um, I was also, uh, I had a, I have like a double major. I was a psych major and I did, I did um, work and experiments with color psychology and theory. And I also did a, anyone has ever done an APA style paper, it's a 25 page paper. And I did it on coping um, children with terminal illness and their coping mechanisms through art therapy. So there was always something there. I just didn't, I, I just, I don't, I didn't have the, the tools or the, I just didn't know how it was gonna you know, come to full circle, if that made sense. You know, and then you get into medical school and medical school for me, it was a, uh, as a really good I, uh, studying tool. I used to draw, I would, I would sketch, I would color. If I would see some, uh, you know, the anatomy, gross anatomy courses or microbiology in order for me to connect, I would come up with mnemonics and I would draw them out. And so my, if you look at like, you go grab my, my books from school, all you're going to see is drawings and paintings and things like that. Arteries, you know, all over the place, yeah. they look like trees. And um, I got to residency and there was not time for anything else. And so then I, you know, I focused on, on my board certification and my private practice. And in private practice, I tried incorporating art. Um, I would draw out the female reproductive system. I would grab like a paper towel and I would draw it out for the patients. And they were like, um that's a uterus that looks like a moose head I'm like oh it's abstract it's abstract <laughs> like, this, is <laughs> this is a tubes mm -hmm. fallopian tubes this is ovaries but funny thing is a lot of them would take that piece of paper with them and they take it home <laughs> so it so, was always a part of me yeah so I guess there is a place and time for abstract and maybe sometimes that we yeah. need more realistic <laughs> so no I got, I got better <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was great. Idea. I hope they held on to them. Did you sign them for them when they took them <laughs> home with them? Oh, <laughs> you know what? I didn't think of doing. I didn't think of. Maybe I'll start implementing that now. <laughs> <laughs> great idea. So why don't we go ahead and look at um, one of your pieces that you actually created uh, before the pandemic? So this is called "Mother Above All," and I'll let you say the Spanish because nobody wants to hear me try to say that in Spanish. Okay. <laughs> so I, I can go ahead yeah okay so this is madre sobre todo and and it's basically we're talking about like mother mother earth mother of everything mother giving birth to everything and so the the painting you know I, I look at it and I just want to give some background that when I when I start painting and I'm thinking of things and I'm 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 creating art. This is actually one of the larger pieces I've done. And I'm not thinking in my head, I don't have this discipline where I, I, I take out my sketchbook or my journal and I, I jot down the colors I'm gonna have and I paint them out and then I draw out in a you know, mini version of it. And then I go and I do it on a large painting. I don't do that. I, I put the canvas in front of me. I start off by, I actually do an exercise and I start off by doing these like, um, shapes. Um, turns out that I'm realizing that what I'm doing is an infinity symbol. And so I start off with infinity symbols on the canvas. And I think that's just an exercise to just release. Um, yeah. When you're working in women's health and you're working, you're, you're like exposed to so many different things. Um, you become their social worker, their educator, resources, their, their community. And so you kind of people talk to you and they share their innermost thoughts and feelings and you kind of just take that in. Um, this was right in that beginning of the pandemic. I didn't get to, I didn't finish it until like throughout the rest of the year. And many women were just expressing experiences, um, you know, the surgical scars, um, loss, loss, you know, pregnant, uh, loss of a pregnancy, um, a baby that was uh, stillborn and you, 
you take this and you have this inside you and you're like, what do I do with this? I, I need to get, I need this, you know, to channel this. But in the, the person that I am, I'm very hopeful and I have this light. So you'll see a lot of light in my paintings, even though the subject matter is deep and can be dark because I, I feel that at the, end of the, at the end of the day, I'm hopeful. So right. my, my paintings start, start off with this infinity symbols, right? The universe, whatever your spiritual belief is. And then we, I start kind of like molding. And before I know, when I step back, I'm starting to create this female form. Of course, it's going to be a pregnant woman. This is what I'm around all the time. <laughs> so it makes sense. Right. And I just, uh, I just, women are amazing. They can do so much. There's, they're, they push forward and they keep, they, they keep going. And, and many people just don't know what's going on, you know, behind closed doors or what's going on in their head. And they just keep on going. And I, I just connected it with our, our earth, mother earth, you know, our earth, our nature. Mm -hmm. So there's greens, there's blues, there's yellows, and just bringing that all together. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the colors. I was just going to ask you about that because we talked about that the other day, that the color just kind of finds itself, it, it brings itself into your work um, because you really enjoy these colors of nature and they help tell the story that you're trying to express through your work. Yes, I, I would agree with that statement. I think it's also... To me, I find there's a source of energy that you feel with these. And if there's someone that's going to go to the exhibit and see my painting, I want them to observe and feel and leave from there that that um, what I wrote as a description makes sense. And you can see that in the painting, because sometimes I just can't find the right words, either in English or Spanish, to really express what I'm you know, accurately express what I'm feeling. I think that's a great segue to our second piece um, that is uh, Be a Mother, Ser Madre. Um, your statement about this piece, um, one of the sentences is uh, that you referenced the news and many immigrants being detained at the border and separated from their children. Can you talk about that a little bit? So, this painting actually, there was an experience I had before, like a few years before I actually mustered, the, you know, actually got the courage to, to actually paint it. But then it circles back to an experience I had with a particular patient. And if I, if, can I go ahead and um, talk a little bit about that? Okay. So in the painting, I, you know, we go back and I mentioned before, I use a lot of um, colors you find in nature, greens and yellows and those like reds. But in this one, you see, um, I, I, I was feeling pain. And so I wanted to ex express that somehow and a struggle and putting myself in the place of someone that's, you know, I can, you know, you hear the news and you say, could you just imagine yourself being, you know, pregnant or, or having a baby and coming to a new country and taking all these risks, exposing yourself to the possibility of separation, not be accepted. There's just so much involved with that. And then, you know, you don't speak the language here. There's, there's a lot involved. And I had this um, point in my life where I transitioned into a new um, position. I left my private practice and I transitioned to being a hospitalist. And um, the story, it's, it, it pertains to this. And it's also maybe, I think back now, uh, <laughs> it was pretty, um, a pretty interesting way of starting a new job. Um, I remember they're like, they I signed up and I said, I, I would go to work. Uh, they said, don't worry, this, this you know, you'll have time to get, get yourself uh, uh, situated and assimilated to the environment. You'll be okay. I'm like, oh, okay. So I walk in and I don't know anybody. I don't know where anything is. I'm very new. I'm just learning where the labor and delivery unit is. And in comes a, um, in comes this mother and she's, you know, all I hear from the nurses report, she broke her water. She's what we call, you know, in our terminology, gravity to para, para one means that she's had a prior pregnancy. So my instincts were, you know, hey, I need to go in the room with her. So I go in the room and they were very, they didn't want to talk to me. They're very, um, distant they didn't speak back to me in english they're locked up in the bathroom and i'm knocking on the door asking questions i'm not getting feedback i knock on the door a little bit harder you know i was a little bit more persistent 
the dad opens the door and, and then they, were, they spoke some type of dialect that sounded a little bit like Spanish, but wasn't clear. It wasn't clearly Spanish. And he's like, I, I don't know body language. I just understood baby's coming. So I grabbed some gloves. I run into the bathroom. I don't know this one, right? So I'm in the bathroom. I'm introducing myself. And she's in there and I see and I see her laboring. And so I go, I go to check her. I ask permission. I go to check her and baby's coming, baby's coming breach. Okay. Breach means baby's coming feet first. Babies, we don't like to deliver babies vaginally feet first. No. So I don't know anybody. That was my introduction to everybody on the uh, uh, in the hospital because we had to, there was no, we didn't have um, a mechanism in place. Like we didn't have a protocol for a situation like this. So one of the nurses just pulled the um, what we call code blue in hospitals. That means that in that terminology, that someone uh, needs uh, resuscitation, someone's dying, we need to do something, we need to intervene. So everybody arrives to the, to the, to the floor and I'm like, hi, everybody. So yeah, that's like, hey, everybody, nice to meet you. And in our medical world, that's like called like the black cloud and maybe we don't wanna work with this person. But if you can imagine this woman um, to kind of like um, fast forward a little bit of the story. The, everything went well. The baby was small. Baby was just coming. There was no way of stopping, no epidural. There was nothing we could do. Uh, the next day I went to round on her. I had reviewed her records and I realized that she re, she had no prenatal care. She came to the hospital a week before and she knew the baby was breached, but she was worried that we would report her. Um, she was undocumented. She was afraid that we would report her or that, that, that we would intervene or take her. You know, she was just afraid. They were afraid. And um, I just, you reference the news, you reference your experience, and then you're like, okay, I need to channel that. And so I did, I did this in this painting. I do have a good end to the story with her. Um, a year and a half later, she comes back and she delivered and I missed her by a day. And I went to go see her. Um, it's just, you know, we do something called postpartum rounds, where we go and we see our patients and we say hi and we check on them, make sure everything's okay. And she made sure that I knew because I gently scolded her <laughs> the last time not to wait so long. And so she made sure that I knew that she was doing better, that she got prenatal care, that um, she was taking English classes, that she was doing things to better herself and her situation. And actually, you know, that just comes to full circle. That's great. I'm glad. I'm glad it all worked out. It sounds like uh, I think we've all had bad first days of work, but that sounds like uh, probably the winner. <laughs> what I would do. I think that might be me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the third piece that you've uh, uh, submitted to the show that's in the exhibition. Now this piece um, is during the pandemic. So this actually is, uh, represents um, PPE and pregnancy and, and the idea, you know, something that I think a lot of us haven't thought about, which is what was that like to be, um, you know, on both sides of that, either be having to, to uh, be a doctor and going in every day into the hospital, knowing that you're trying to help bring life into the world but at the same time you must have had fear for your own life and where most of us you know the day of the shutdown we all kind of went home and started thinking well gosh I guess I need to find a mask I guess I'll go on Amazon or you know find somewhere I, I'll order a mask and it'll arrive in a week or so but you woke up the next morning and you had to go to work mm -hmm. and and somehow come up with your own your own protection to now go into the hospital where other COVID patients were. So can you talk a little bit about that and then how specifically you've tried to work through that in, in this particular piece? So um, I'd like to tie in this piece along with how the pandemic affected me too, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna start off talking about this. When I when I uh, when I was working on this painting, this is a three hundred pound uh, cold press watercolor paper, and I think I did. I had a couple of um, I do I do twenty four hour call shifts, so I'll, I'll work a twenty four hour call, and then I I can be a few days off. I can be even more time off, and then go back. But this particular time, I did a couple I, I did a couple of shifts really close together, and I I just 
there we didn't know what was going on in the hospital we were look, working and trying to implement some policies and protocols uh, we weren't sure you know I, I was working at a really small hospital we didn't we didn't have the manpower or the capability of working with a, a, a pregnant patient with COVID and we weren't testing yet. So you arrive to work and your energy is expended. And I'm speaking about my experience, but I have so many other colleagues that in the pandemic were working two weeks in a row or more. And when I mean two weeks in a row, they're doing 24 hour, like they're having office and call, um, experiencing what I'm experiencing, but even at a, like just another level, okay? And many, our, our facility just, um, you, you just get home and you're right, you, I arrived home and I was just really, you know, exhausted. Uh, and I, uh, I think this is one of the things that we connected on the art Zooms meeting and I'm exhausted, but I feel like I need to, to channel this energy and, and create. And so I started envisioning this, like, you know how I said, I start off with these like um, lines or these infinity lines. With this one, I actually started off with like an outline with charcoal. And then I started working with it. And then it, it developed into like me visualizing a healthcare worker and then someone that's pregnant because I, you know, you have some colleagues that are pregnant and they're working in this environment. And how about them? They're carrying a baby and they're not being protected. They're not giving their PPE. You know, she's in this, in this piece, she's just wearing a regular level one mask because it's relatable. Everybody has that. Everybody's been using that, but we weren't given that. And so you you think to yourself and you put yourself in someone's position, like I feel this, but could you imagine if I was in that position where every day I'm, I'm going to work, I'm exposing myself to this uh, unknown virus and I can bring that home. I can expose my, the rest of my family. Um, people are dying. What, what do you do? But, but when, you, when you decided to, um, you know, you take, an, you take an oath, you take the Hippocratic oath and you say, I'm, 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 I'm doing this because my purpose is to help people. And you kind of sometimes don't, you just put that to the side and you don't think. And I had many friends that would at times talk to me um, that worked at other hospital settings. And I, you know, I always tell them, make sure you wear your mask, make sure you cover yourself first, even though you know the baby is going, you know, there's something concerning with the, your patient or their baby, make sure you protect yourself first, right? There's this, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a saying, uh, why, how about when we, well, we're flying again, but when we're flying on, on an airplane, right? What do they always tell us? Put your oxygen mask first, yeah. then treat the person that's next to you, right? So it's the yeah. same concept here. Put your face mask on first, put your personal protective equipment and protect yourself first so you can help others. Um, I think that the blue may be representation of exhaustion and sadness, but it's also at times just the color, <laughs> really, honestly, um, it's the color of the surgical scrubs we wear and the surgical um, hat and cover covering uh, when we're doing surgery. And I don't know, for me, for me, you know, everybody, the observer, you, I, the whole point of me doing abstract is so that you can take from it what you feel. But you're asking me to explain what I what I did about this. I just envisioned this this beautiful woman who had a really, really you know, just a very really hard case after surgery. And she's sitting on this like windowsill looking out the window and, and she's just really, she's sad. She's sad, she's tired. She's, you know, life is uncertain and you know, what do you do? And so I paint it. How does creating a painting like this um, help you work through this stress and the everyday kind of trauma that you're going through as, as a healthcare professional in the time of the pandemic? Well, I think that, um, you know, there's, before I can answer that question, I think there's more that I have to share about the pandemic last year. So you can really understand my segue into talking about the, like uh, another, you know, the subject of like using RS therapy. Um, if it's if that was all right with you, Randall. Absolutely. 
Great. So, <laughs> so on, um, I'm wanting to talk like, if we were gonna focus our conversation about, uh, about the pandemic last year, um, for me personally, it was uh, a very like uncertain time. We did not know how we were gonna treat patients, policies, protocols, no one knew, we don't know. They're telling you at one time, you know, you got six feet apart, wear your mask, be careful now it's aerolized, be, you know, X, Y, Z, everybody heard the same thing. Okay, so everybody's home, but we have to go to work. And the hospital I was working at was not protecting, I'm just gonna be very transparent. It wasn't protecting its staff. It wasn't protecting us. Uh, in the beginning, I was using a uh, an, like a N95 mask that my husband gave me from his garage. Um, we would, you know, arrive to, you know, like every, you arrive, you get your temperature checked, they give you this level one mask. It's really not protecting you. We're not. Remember, I mentioned that we're not testing patients, so you don't know what you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to protect yourself. And then, um, you know, I remember this incident. When you're doing surgery, you're always using this, we call it a level three mask. It's a surgical mask, the filtration of it's a little bit thicker and it has a face shield. And I couldn't find it. And so all of a sudden everything was like locked up. So I, I went and I, um, I, I couldn't find them. I had to go do surgery and have a couple of deliveries. This is something standard. We, this is standard practice. I, this is what I use as part of my personal protective equipment uh, side of COVID. Okay, so I asked the head like nurse administrator on for the hospital. And she says to me, oh, okay, you know, here, I'll, I'll bring you some. So she brings me five in a paper bag. And I said, okay. And I said, oh, okay, this is for today. And she says, no, that's it. That's what you're going to get. And I said, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. And, I, and I, I write my name on them. And I guard them. And then I ask, well, can I get some extra for my staff? And she, they said to me, no. I thought about whether or not I should bring that up today. And I think that people should know, they should be aware that there was a lot of us. And when I say my staff, I mean, you know, my other, other physicians, the nurses, nursing staff, there's a team, right? There's a team that's part of your unit and it's like your birth team too. And we weren't being protected, okay? This is happening. Um, funny thing is, is that I, I, I uh, in the beginning I was saying, I, you know, I told you I wrote those masks. I, I was laying them, I was bringing them home, cleaning them and I was hanging them in my laundry room. And then I don't know, I, I take a picture of it, right? This, this, this thing of like, let me be creative here. And I take a picture of it and I call it wash and repeat. And I, and I took the, I spin that opportunity and I submitted that into the recycled art show for the Castleberry Art House figure. They accepted it. I guess I was trying to, I was trying to take that experience and make it, a, I think that that was me starting to try to find my voice and, and speak about this. Um, I wanted to also share share this that during the pandemic like last year and working and everything that's happening and you know there was more increases in um, I'm trying to be careful how I speak because I have young years listening <laughs> and so I was there was you know everyone's on lockdown so now the things that that um, we know about but aren't mentioned much in society we're seeing it now right. So I'm seeing in the hospital more incidences of intimate partner violence, um, human trafficking, assaults. Um, these are pregnant women. There's like, everyone's like worried and concerned. I, um, there, there was a situation that happened last year and I don't, I haven't painted it yet. I've journaled it, but it was so horrendous of what I witnessed, what happened to this woman. She was, a, she's a, you know, she's a ex-military, PTSD, fought for our country, right? Fought, helped to help us. And um, I, I don't remember right now if she lost her job or what was happening and her husband. So her husband, her children and herself, they're all home. The, the, this, <laughs> What the what I saw happen to her 
was so unimaginable that it echoed in me and it still does till today that that um people being in lockdown and being at home and there's violence going on at home was really apparent and so then I had to make a decision and I talked to one of my colleagues and I was I was like okay I think I'm gonna have to report this to to the Department of Children and Families because something can happen to these kids right everybody's home and um at first I couldn't even have a conversation with her because she arrived it was one of these like situations where you get called as an emergency. She was a patient to nobody. So she becomes mine. And um, you know, I take care of all the unassigned patients. And she was, um, she had lost the consciousness. She was at altered mental status. She couldn't speak to you. I'm not gonna go into detail about, about the physical um, aspects of her exam, but I had to wait till she was more um, oriented to time and place to have a conversation with her. And that's what you're seeing. All these different, um, everything. And then you're seeing on the news, you know, you mentioned George, Flo George Floyd and, and you're seeing, you know, racial injustice, gender inequality, everything is just growing. And I'm not an expert in that topic. I'm not gonna go elaborate on that, but you, you see this and how are you gonna ignore that that's happening? That you feel that. And then you're also working with it. So yes, I, um, I, I'm feeling all these things. I'm feeling uncertain. I'm feeling unsafe in my working environment. And then I get hit with like a really big bomb. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, we're doing all this. And on National Doctors' Day, I'm going to say that. Yep, I'm going to put it out there. On National Doctors' Day, my employer leaves him a voice message. And I'm like, oh, okay, what's that about? I call back and I'm told, hey, you know, hey, Dr. Hernandez, um, you know, the company's taking some losses with this lockdown and, you know, yada, yada, yada. We decided to defund the hospital's program. I'm like, um, come again? Yeah, what does that mean? That means that you're out of a job. Excuse me? Yes, and all your other hospitals, hospitalists too. So it was 11 or more. I can't remember right now. And we all we and and then and then if that wasn't enough, we were we were we were given certified letters. We were told you need to work throughout the pandemic for the next couple of months. And you know the caveat is that you, we will we will enforce your non-compete. So that means that you can't leave and go work somewhere else. What do you do with that? you got to channel that energy, right? You got to keep working. You got to hold your head up high and you got to go, go back to work and do what you do best. You know, you have this responsibility. So I don't know if you want me to segue into art therapy here or if you want me to wait a little bit. Well, I think, um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for being there for so many people in our community for this last year, because, you know, we all, can assume that it was difficult um, for, for our healthcare workers, but to hear a personal story like this, and thank you for being so brave and being willing to share that story with us. I really appreciate that. So you've now created another piece since the show opened that um, you sent to me. And I feel like that is, that is about your therapy and it is about the future and it's actually called Esperanza or hope. So I think we would all love to hear about how everything you've been through, you've come out with Esperanza. So I'm gonna tie this story into something else that happened last year because it ties into this art therapy and to, to kind of like say, you know, resilience is something that's, that is, being a resilient person really can do amazing things for you, you know? Um, so I, I, talk, I just talked to you about what happened with my job and everything like that. Okay, so we move, move forward, moving forward. Uh, I'm arriving on my last day of work and it's, uh, you know, it's customary for me. I was, I was always, I would call my brother when I would get off my 24 hour call and I would have a conversation with him, my younger brother. And um, I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but 
I, I don't share his story, right? It's his story. But my younger brother throughout the year of the pandemic was um, suffering with his own medical illness. And, you know, I would always call and check in on him. And I called him that morning and I was talking with him. And I don't know where it's like, I'm talking with him, something's not right. And later in the day, I find out that he's admitted to a New York City hospital and um, he's now being transferred to ICU. And he's in what we call a, like a multi-organ, a multi-failure, or, you know, excuse me, multi-organ failure system, which means that your organs are just shutting down. They're not, they're not working. And um, my family was tested. I was tested. You know, there's, there, you're, lock, you're down here, there's quarantine. New York City had rules. I couldn't go up there. I wasn't going to be allowed in the hospital anyways. And so we're, um, just to mention a little bit, you know, I was raised by a single mother and I, and I have an older sister and I have, my brothers are, are, are um, younger and they're twins. And um, that's, 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 that's all I have. That's what I have. That's the, we're, we're really, um, we're really tight and we're really connected. I know we're all adults, but we, we, it's just our family dynamics. You know, we're just always, since we were kids, you know, pulling through. And I have other family members and cousins and we're really close too, but my siblings are, and my mother are, are something, you know, it's my dynamic. So this is all happening. I'm trying to explain things to my sister because she's in New York with him. And doctors are talking to me on the phone and then I'm being told um, your brother's, you know, in respiratory distress and you have to make a decision to intubate him. And then they start treating him like a COVID patient. Um, they're putting him in prone position. That means like face down. Um, he was really critical. And he was in that situation for a long time. Sorry. Can you give me a second? I didn't think I would, but I want to share this. It's important. He was um, in really critical condition. And, you know, I'm a physician, but I'm his sister. I can't be there to support him, but I, I, I have the knowledge. And so I'm relaying information through like this, like texting, right, service to my sister. These are things you need to ask. Doctors are asking me questions. I'm making these really tough decisions on his life. And, um, you know, along with my, with, my, with my siblings, you know, we're doing like video calls, and I'm like, I think that this is what we should do. Do we all agree? And, you know, my brother, they're young. So, you know, he's not, he's not married. They're young. And so we're, we're his like healthcare proxies. And um, that was a long time. And those are, that was a very scary time and a difficult time in my life. And I had doctors telling me that um, he's really young and they were trying to tell me to be positive, but I didn't share this with my siblings, but you know, I, I, I know medicine, I, I know what that is. And I just kept praying that he would come off the ventilator. And I, I'm like, when is that gonna happen? When's that gonna happen? We'll have better you know, chance here. And um, moving forward to present day, and I painted this earlier this year, um, he's alive and he's recovering. Um, there's still a lot to figure out. And he, he has his own personal, journey and story and I'll, I'll let him elaborate on that but I last year we have COVID everyone's in lockdown but then everybody has their own personal journey that's happening and you know I I, I felt like the most uncertainty of certain things I'm, number one I'm an OBGYN babies are delivering all the time how do how did they just tell us that we're, they're letting us go. And it was a group of us, not just, I, that's un, unfathomable. Like I can't process that. Then my, my younger sibling almost passed, you know, like he was in a really critical con condition and, and you're like, what is going on? And then this like glimmer of hope comes around. They start announcing, hey, you know, there's these vaccines and, you know, they're mRNA vaccines and they're going to come out. It's a newer way. This is why we have them out and we're going to roll out with them. And then I start getting more information about it and I'm, I'm educating myself. And then 
I think I have to say one of the, I'm going to be honest, I had a really hard year last year. And one of the happiest things in, for last year that was like a major win of like he survived and we we're okay was um, getting an email from the hospital telling me um, we, you know, we did an algorithm or whatever and we're reaching out and we think that you are deserving to get this vaccine. And you start thinking to yourself, you know what? Maybe there is hope. Maybe there, there, you know, this this woman in the beginning of the year that was feeling exhausted and tired and and didn't, wasn't seeing a way out. Um, there's there's hope out there. There's a vac- there's vaccines. And so then now, I remember just getting my first vaccine. At first, I was like telling my family, and they're like, oh, but you know, everybody, when you're pushing something that's new right? The science is new. No one knows. And I'm like, well, guys, I'm not just going and getting something I don't know about. I educated myself about it. It's just, you know, <laughs> there were jokes like I would, I don't know, you know, I would change or something, you know, people are funny, but I'm like, it's, it's the, the educate yourself. It's the, the mRNA vaccine is, is just a different way that they're doing the vaccine. And it, the reason why I think that people think that there wasn't studies done on it. There was, there were studies, there were participants. It wasn't like one person. We're talking about in the thousands. These are, these were all, these vaccines that are all now have been studied. Do I know in the future what mRNA vaccines, if there will be side effects or something like that? I, I did the research. I did an educated informed guess from, you know, like consent for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to get the vaccine. And, and when people ask me now, should I get the vaccine? I said, absolutely protect yourself protect others but it's a personal decision but the getting you know circling back to this painting it was the first time in a really long time and I said to myself you know what this in this one I was intentional um I'm gonna sit here I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back and tie in the and you know ending the year then now there's hope and you see the you see that the blues are a little bit brighter I'm using more vibrant colors um, if I don't know if you, if anyone can really see, but there's a hummingbird in there too. And there's just different, um, you know, she's at the window and she's seeing spring and she's seeing things come, come to life. Do you want me to highlight the hummingbird <laughs> or do you see it? It's, it's up by her nose. Yes. <laughs> and um, there's hope. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. I, and I got my first shot today. So I really feel the hope today as well. So, wow, thank you. That was- um, Oh, I know, I'm sorry. That was a lot. Thank you so much. But um, I think now um, I can't imagine that there must be a lot of questions from our audience. So Danielle, do we have any questions from the audience? Anything anyone would like to ask um, Eileen? I don't see any yet. If anyone would like to put it into the Q&A box, we can, um, we'd be happy to bring them up. Okay. Give them just a minute. Well, I have some extra things to share if people would like me to share some, some things. All right, we do have one question. It's from okay. Donald and asks if you feel relaxed when you paint. So, Actually, that's a really great question. Thank you, Donald. I, and I want to just plug in. He's one of my art Zoom mates. Hey, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer hey, your Donald. question, I, I have to go back to something that happened to me that was really, really important. And it ties into this. Um, it ties into this. When I turned 40, my husband says to me, I want to give you something that's a meaningful gift. And I want to, you know, I want to give you something that's a meaningful gift and I want it to help you better you, you know, for you. And so I said, well, what what is that? What are you going to give me? You know, what are you going to give me? He said, you know, a few years ago, you mentioned um, Creality School of Art. I'm like, yeah, honey, why? Because when I looked up that they have this introduction to drawing and painting class, I said, okay. And he says, it's on Saturdays, see if it works in your schedule. So I looked at my schedule and I made it work. I would arrive to class in scrubs. I would throw art supplies in my trunk and I would just really try to do the best possible to 
get to the to the classes. Well, one of the things that they kind of to you know part of like the process of introducing you to different mediums is watercolor, and I took to watercolor. I just found it profoundly relaxing the fluidity of working with that medium. And I felt it was meditative. And then working working with that, that's just, it's kind of like I got hooked. And I'm like, okay, I got to do more. I want to learn more. And I remember, um, I'll share this really quickly. I remember a time in this intro, introduction to drawing and painting class where um, one day it was going to be, okay, we're going to teach you how to use charcoals. And um, it was a substitute um, instructor that day. And she comes in and she's teaching us things and she starts talking about, hey, no, Eileen, it seems like you like abstract form. So I have an exploring and painting class on Tuesdays from one to three. I'm like, oh, okay. Cause I just started realizing, no, I like this. And then she says to me, then I thought to myself, I was in private practice. How could I get time off during the day to go do you know, this class? And I, and I just thought to myself, oh my God, well, how, how would love, love to do that? And I thought about it a lot and I thought about it a lot. And you know, I just tell people out there that if you really think about something, you wanna do something, um, you know, put it out there, affirm it, and you'll see it come to you know, fruition. And then when I transitioned to this uh, hospital position, I started changing things where I would schedule and put my classes first, then I would do my work schedule. And then I was able to take that abstract uh, painting glass and um, I don't know if anyone has any questions about how I got into abstract painting and how that how that all developed I think should I elaborate on that or any other questions before I sure, well, I'm so glad that you um, took those classes and just a reminder to everyone watching um, uh, Creality is a great school and we and uh, that uh, in history museums in Maitland also has a great art school and we are registering right now for our next semester. So if you would like to explore some of your artistic talents and, and discover something new, just like Eileen did, um, go online and you can look at our calendar and maybe find your future art projects that are there. So um, Eileen, I think we may, may have had another question come in. Um, okay. Let's see if we can get that. And if not, we'll go back to um, We have one more from Rosalie. She asked if you have pieces by period or themes and if you have a series. I, so elaborating on what I was just talking about, I, um, I started off with watercolor. And then when I transitioned from private practice to the OB hospitalist position, I um, started to take more classes. So I started working with charcoal and portrait drawing, watercolor pencils. Um, I started doing small paintings and started growing. And then I, I really need to um, talk about, about this as a, my growth as an artist. I hadn't, and this is my intro to like mixed media and abstract painting. Um, I took a storytelling through our journaling course with the artist Patricia Byron, and that was like mind blowing. It was, uh, she pushed me. She pushed me to paint in different directions, upside down, uh, take things off, you know, like collage things off the page. And I'm a type A <laughs> perfectionist. This is like totally against my grain. My type A perfectionism has made me a successful physician, but as an artist, like you're really pushing, like um, I had a really hard time that things were just not in line. So that pushed me and opened me to, to the world of abstract art. And then I started telling myself, I'm not in an operating room. I'm not taking care of patients. I can loosen up and I can just unwind. And so I, to answer Rosalie's question, I have, um, I, I work in many different mediums from watercolor to, to um, I do sketching and drawing. I do abstract painting. I work with actually going back to watercolor. I actually really enjoy working with uh, fluid acrylics because I can move the paints around. They don't dry so fast on me and I feel like they're watercolor. And um, so I kind of work with little different things and I'm constantly wanting to experiment and try something different and new. Right now I'm working on uh, 
these like so flat matte acrylics on a wooden panel. I've worked on watercolor paper. I've worked on canvas panels and canvas, but I haven't worked on a wood panel. So I'm kind of trying mm -hmm. to figure out how I like that. And do I want the, do I want to cover the wood grain or do I want right. it to show? That's great. Well, that's one of the wonderful things that we have the opportunity to just keep experimenting and trying new things and, and see what um, really uh, sparks your imagination and, and what you want to do next. So Eileen, I, I really appreciate your time. I can't believe this evening has gone by so quickly. Um, I told you it would, but they, all, they seem to go by so fast, but we really appreciate you joining us tonight. And um, everyone, please come and see Eileen's work in the exhibition. It is there through Mother's Day, perfect place to take your mother for Mother's Day on uh, May 9th. Um, our next artist talk will be on April 7th, and that will be with Richland and Weldon Ryan. They both have works in the exhibition. And you can sign up on that uh, to watch, to uh, learn more about them and their work uh, by going to Eventbrite, just like you did tonight. And I, I hope you enjoyed this talk. And uh, if you did, you can help us provide more programming like this um, by uh, going to uh, texting AHMM to 7177 and just help support us a little bit. And uh, right now we're in our uh, uh, campaign, uh, fundraising campaign with United Arts. So anything donated right now will be matched from 15 to 30%. So it's a great time to help support the arts community. Um, like so many, we're really working hard to get through this last year so we can use your help. And we hope you enjoyed tonight. Eileen, any last words before we say goodnight to everyone? Um, I actually, I, I do. I, I, I just want everyone to know that it's never too late and that you need to find what truly makes you, you know, happy and find a way that you can put out to, you know, this world to, to kindness and compassion into this world. And, and I'm personally right now, I'm eager to continue my journey and just really embracing this physician artist and, and kind of just finally, you know, intertwine this and align this part of me and and I just want to tell everybody that you know if we're winding up now that I think that just you need to look around you and to find your inspiration and do something journal do yoga meditate paint um be a maker use the fiber arts you do just create disconnect a little bit do a, a disconnect from you know digital detox and, and go and create and you'll find that that it is a practice that does align with you and you will be more balanced and you'll never know what you're fully capable of unless you give that give it that time and I just I just really want to tell everybody thank you so much for for taking the time out of their busy schedules or, or taking an interest in in, in just uh, supporting me today and being part of this uh, artist conversation and I really am grateful for all my family and friends and colleagues that have supported me throughout this journey in the past couple of years um, and just want to tell you Randall with my sincerest gratitude thank you so much I you didn't even know that I was <laughs> that I was a physician and and you saw my art and it ins was inspiring enough to be part of this museum exhibit and I hope that if those that are listening haven't I haven't been able to go down to the Art and History Museum that they should. And if for those of that live, like I know that we have some that are not here in Florida, just go support your local museums and you know the arts and culture in your towns. Absolutely. And um, I also wanted to say uh, thank you to Katie and Dan because I know I met them on that on the day I turned in the exhibit. And you know, just to everybody. Uh, you know, look around you, inspiration's there, go create and, and find your way to heal. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Randall. Thank you for having me.